What is up, brothers and sisters? It's Jay Campbell, and you're listening to The Jay Campbell Podcast. Join me for regular deep dives with amazing beings whose work is manifesting a golden age. And remember, you create your reality by your focused thoughts, conscious words, and intentional actions. Raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. Hey guys, what's up? It's Jay Campbell and I'm making a quick commercial here for seercustom.com, my revolutionary cosmeceutical peptides company, co-founded with my business partner, Nick Andrews, who happens to be one of the world's top formulators. We have the revolutionary Oxano Grow, which completely regrew my hair. If you guys saw my hair about a year ago, I was almost bald. I even had the micropigmentation program from uh, Advantis. And now I've completely regrown my hair. That's just with version one. Version two is now in the marketplace or will be very, very soon. And it is three to five times as more effective than the current version or the original beta version of Oxano. We also have Royal Blue Serum and Sky Blue Cream, which will completely upgrade your face. I mean, I'm almost 50 years old. I have a pretty good complexion. I use it regularly. My wife swears by it. It will reduce fine lines and wrinkles, dramatically improve elasticity, and just the overall look and feel of your face. You feel great on both of them. You can also use them with red light therapy. There's all sorts of great stuff. So go to a seercustom.com. And if you're a first time customer, use the coupon J15 to take 15% off your purchase. I appreciate all you guys. And I send you tremendous love and light. Hey guys, what is going on? It's Jay Campbell with the Jay Campbell podcast. And I'm very excited today to be joined in my Zoom virtual studio by Dr. Yousef Smith from Propane Fitness. Yousef, what's up, brother? How are you, man? Jay, thanks for having me on. It's an honor to have you. You and I just did an amazing podcast for your podcast, which is Propane Fitness. We talked about all sorts of amazing things, which we're obviously going to get to, of course, here today. But as I always do on the podcast, on the Jay Campbell podcast, which used to be the TOT Revolution podcast, I kind of like to ask my guests, you know, just a little bit of personal, candid stuff, one-on-one. How did you get on the Jay Campbell podcast here today, Yousef? Oh, so I initially did a bit of reading about estrogen exposure to environmental um, hormone disruptors. And it took me on a journey to have a chat with Dr. Anthony Jay, who you're good friends with. I did a 12 week experiment after that, where I tested my blood work before and after a 12 week period, trying to eliminate as many of the sources of environmental estrogen as I could. And uh, what ended up happening was my free testosterone went up and my estrogen went up as well. So um, I took measurements and blood work and so on. After doing that and after having an interpretation by Dr. J, he recommended that I get in touch with you. Sure. And uh, we had an awesome podcast on, on ours and here we are. Yeah, man. Awesome. And, you know, for everybody, for his bio, um, Yusuf is a doctor. He's practicing right now in where in the UK? specifically in the north of england in the north of england there you go he's obviously again he's a coach at propane fitness teaches strength training to thousands of clients and you know he's worked with a lot of people and again he's very very uh what i would call accomplished and high conscious writer he's very very meticulous and in depth when he researches and as i told him before i came on his podcast um I, I don't go on very many people's podcasts today unless they impress me with either their writing or their insights. And he did both. So it, it's an honor to have him now, obviously, to kind of throw it back and do the quid pro quo. Um, we could go a lot of different directions. Um, Yousef is a really high conscious guy. He just went on a 10-day meditation, a Vipassana meditation retreat, which I want to get to. But I think before we go down the consciousness path, because that's kind of the way I want to go these days now. Is so like Once it goes on that path, we're going to be... Off. It, right but we'll finish it with that because obviously yes that's the most important thing today um but i want to do talk about like what you see in the uk you know with your partner johnny and you know what you guys from a training standpoint strength training standpoint working with younger people and you know i'll just kind of set the narrative as and i know we both agree with this but i want to see where you take this um you know, we're in the age of information, right? Technology is everywhere. There's screen saturation. There's bombardment. People, it's very difficult for younger generation people, whether you classify them as millennials or Gen Z or what even is below them. And, you know, I have two kids that are in below them, uh, but they're just bombarded you, Seth, right? Like it, there's so much information coming from so many different angles that without a mentor or some master in their life, you know, and I would assume, you know, I would, I would accuse 
people like you and I have been in the game, we've been in the trenches, you know, you have a medical background. I mean, obviously I've written a bunch of books, you know, we've attained some level of mastery, you know, again, due to stepping on the shoulders of others and learning and being in the trenches. But as you, as you know, a lot of these younger people today, it's so um, fragmented. There's so much, they can go online and they can read one, you know, fit bro and then one doctor or one, you know, guru, and everybody is canceling everybody out, right? You've got like so many different, you know, cords of information and echo chambers. What is a young person, you know, 21, 22 year old conscious being who really does want to improve their physique, who really does want to take their body to the next level? How do they attempt or how do you in your interpretation or opinion think that they can, you know, wade through the signal and the noise and hone in? Such a good point. And it's actually what led me to do my medical degree in the first place, just because awesome. we set up propane thinking like there is the signal to noise ratio is way off. Right. And you're right that maybe 30, maybe even 20 years ago, we were suffering from problems of scarcity, right. that the control was exerted by people by restricting the flow of information. And suddenly this, this like explosion of the internet flipped it over to problems of abundance and now we have exactly the opposite. We've got yeah. so much control being exerted from the uh, sensory overload of information that it's very difficult to then differentiate between signal and noise. And not only that, is that when you even look for the information, trying to, trying to find like what sources are verifiable, what sources are credible, but then even when you start going down a single rabbit hole, the algorithms and everything start supporting your existing views. And so, as you said, like people can look for an answer with something and they will only find reams of data to support it. Right. And, and the internet almost um, fuels this confirmation bias at a really algorithmic level. And it's yes. pretty scary. So yeah, like to be able to try and see past that, I just thought, well, I've got no choice. Got to go get a medical degree. <laughs> so, right. right. But you could even argue, I, I, actually, I want to go back to something you just said, because you hit it right out of the park. And I've, no one's ever actually brought this up on the show before. So awesome to you. Credit to you is that that algorithm is being fed through YouTube. It's being thread through Google. It's being fed through your phone, right? So as soon as you start going down these pathways, that's all they serve you now. So you're right. It's like this constant re-emphasis echo chamber. <laughs> so anyway, to your point though, and I want to get back, you know, um, because I could make an argument that yes, you went the medical path, but the medical path is an echo chamber too, right? Like, as you know, especially in- Yeah, absolutely, life. everything. I mean, everything, right, like, everything you know, I can just keep going down rabbit holes with this, but like, <laughs> let's be honest, right? Like you learn, regardless of who you are, from doing, right? From actual creation. So you built an awesome physique, you know, your partner, you guys coach people, you're in the trenches, you're doing it, you know, same thing for me. The problem with the young kids is, they get their, you know, mentorship from, again, this information online, which they can't verify is even legit, right? If they're working with you and Johnny, they, they got legit practitioners, guys who have built their physiques, guys that know what they're doing. Same with me or other people like us. But, you know, these young kids reading these information blogs and these $99, you know, self-help guru, like, you know, do this type of workout program. I mean, bro, they have zero mentorship. And then there's the whole thing too, with like being online, how are you going to learn how to do it correctly? Yeah, exactly. And it, well, this is the value of a coach as well, that I, I am very much of the opinion that time is so much more expensive than money per of unit. And so hiring a coach is literally, it's the closest thing you can do to a time machine. Like it's Agreed. buying time. Agreed to Agreed. accelerate your journey. And the difficulty then actually comes in selecting the coach rather than going for coaching in general. And, and so you're right that the, the problem then is finding a path written by someone who has actually done the result that you're trying to achieve. And so I think holding any coach or any, even, um, even if you read a book, that's still, you've taken on a mentor, as you said, because right. it just, just in a very scalable form, Sure, you need to look at, what results has this person achieved? And it's not necessarily like, oh, I want to play basketball at pro level, so it have to, has to be by a pro basketball. It sure. could be by a, a basketball coach who has produced pro basketball sure. players. Right. But as long as there's some evidence of them having walked the walk, as you said. Right. Well, the hard part for me is, good, a very good points, well taken. I want to go deeper. The, the hard part for me, and this is why I've never really 
bother to develop like a coaching company because I have a lot of people who want to coach with me. But, you know, as you and I talked on our last podcast, like trading time for money is really not the deal. But if I could work with people in person, uh, I would love to do that. And I have done that, you know, way back in my past, in my 20s, I actually worked at Gold's Gym in Pasadena, California for four years as like a very high level working with like extremely wealthy people. Like I actually worked with the guy who owned, uh, I forget, it was Invesco Oil or something. He sold his company for like $400 million back in the day. But like, I truly enjoyed working with people like, you know, physical hand on hand, you know, bo- hand on body working with their form, working with, you know, their, um, you know, biomechanics and all of the, you know, functional stuff, but working online with people that you don't know, you know, who obviously know that you know your stuff, but you, if you can't be there supervising them, like again, in a biomechanical type of way, I've always kind of shied away from that because I can't really, uh, you know, ascertain that they're really doing it correctly. Now, of course, they can make videos and they can send them to you and stuff like that. And you understand where I'm going with it. Right. But it's, again, yeah. that's why so many people are not learning the fundamentals because they're not getting the proper instruction. So going back to what you said, hiring a coach, there's nothing more important. There really isn't. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's, there's two personality traits kind of to come back to the question you said about someone who's young and is, you know, being bl- ass blasted by this amount of sure. information and they can't, they can't differentiate the two personality traits that I think really will help you navigate this are being high agency right. and being empirical with the way that you approach things. Right. So by high agency, I mean um, the kind of person who rather than like just when they find a, a block with something, they just go, oh, well, mustn't be possible right. is they immediately ask the question, how can this be done? Right. And they will never ask someone a question that can just be Googled. Yep. So that's on one hand, the other trait is being empirical and i think um this is where i think your um issue with the traditional medical education system comes from sure. let me know if i'm wrong here no but you're right but it's not that it that the um mechanisms and the the whole medical system is wrong in any way it's just that it's it's very slow to adjust its right. um, its course exactly. like a big oil tanker that yes. is quite slow to pick up on new evidence right and so you can either sit and wait for the new research on things to come out. Like we were talking about just pre-roll about um, estrogen. Sure. You know, you can, we can wait 20 years until we're all infertile or (laughs) we can say, actually, maybe the evidence is a little bit um, ahead of the kind of traditional model. So we need to look at the cutting edge stuff and adopt that. And I think you are incredible at doing that. Like you, you, you're like always at the precipice of what there is available. Well, I appreciate you saying that, man. And yeah, I mean, I wish I could take all the credit, stepping on the shoulders of giants. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of my ideal is like, you know, really go out on the edge and be a visionary or attempt to be a visionary. But, you know, to your point um, with, with medicine, it, exactly. It's dogmatic and, inertia, and full of inertia. And it just takes forever to write that gigantic ocean barge, you know, oil tanker, as you called it, you know, and actually redirect the course. Uh, but again, individuals like yourself and other people out there by practicing a very, I, what I would call, a, again, a, a holistic, more humanistic, functional strength, better eating, you know, not the dogmatic, you know, sick care, you know, prescribed pills, you know, treat symptoms. Um, it is slowly changing. And again, it's awesome because, I, you know, you said you wanted to be eventually a GP. And we need people like you to be GP, you know, not the old 75 year old stodgy guys who are bent over with a giant paunch. You know what I'm saying? That are like the average. It's not credible. You know, GP. <laughs> if, you, know you, you wouldn't hire a fat personal trainer. And if, if a doctor is doing, you know, if it, I, I think that the thing that you just can't do as a doctor is smoke. Like I, there's a lot of stuff, especially in the UK that, you know, doctors have to present this kind of image of being very professional and not right. swear. And, right. and I think, you know what, people can do what they want on their own time. Right. But if you sure. smoke, it's <laughs> the example that you're giving to your patients is like, Hey, well, I, I don't care about this stuff. And, and, and it, it projects a image of like, well, my risk appetite and um, sure. my assessment of the evidence of this is so anyway, don't get me started. Well, I mean, no, I mean, I love that, but like, to me, that's just consciousness, right? Like you're going back to like, if you're literally that unconscious of your own personal health and level of being, and yeah, that doesn't even f- factor in the idea that you're supposed to be a bastion and a guardian of health as a doctor. Right. That's insanity. All right. I want to, one more thing, and then we're going to get on the consciousness path. Um, 
you have a really good one in here. Um, how to balance, you know, diet and training around a normal life with real commitments. And then we'll even throw in, you know, taking fitness advice from young fit bros on the internet. We kind of already hit that. Um, but, but I'll just say this and then I want you to go deep as you want. Um, you know, there's a guy on Twitter I follow. He's actually a good friend of mine. He's a young guy. He's only 32, 31, Alexander Juan Antonio Cortez. But he actually had like an axiom that he put on Twitter one time. He said, if you take fitness advice from anyone under 25 years old, you absolutely have no idea what you're doing, right? So, yep. so, the, so the reality is, and this is not a slam on visionary young guys. There, there are some out there. They're outliers. But again, it's life experience, right? Like you cannot hire somebody if you're again conscientious yourself you know and you want to build an amazing physique and understand like how to get there without also taking in the fact that you should be getting your advice from someone who's already walked the walk as you already said on this podcast who's literally living their life on that path and has 15 or 20 years and again i don't want to offend people there's some young guys that listen to my show and they're like jay i've been doing it since i was 11 man i got 10 years in the game (laughs) <laughs> right. But the average guy, right, at 25 has a lot to learn still. You had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn. It's just the way life is. You know, the, the ancient Egyptians and the mystery schools, you couldn't even apply to get in until you were 40. Right. So it's like, you know, this is kind of another a life axiom of like, you know, don't take advice from people that haven't walked the walk or have been on the path long enough. And again, I know there's exceptions and there's outliers, but you know, just your comment on, you know, that whole idea of, again, who you get your advice from in a, from a fitness capacity, and then also like living a work-life balance and being fit. Yeah, the, this is it, man. I, and the, the, the idea of the 25-year-old fitness guy giving, fit, giving advice, unless they really understand their client niche deeply, right. Right. then they are operating usually in a situation where they have far fewer constraints than a lot of their clients. And this was kind of the problem that we saw. And part of the reason to, to, to start creating our content with propane, which is much more about marrying a normal life, you know, a a realistic life with a training program, which is that people impose a full-time athletes expectations on someone who works night shifts and has kids (laughs) to feed and has duty of care over people and this kind of thing. And it's like, it is, you know, it's fine for a 23 year old guy who has no commitments and right. um, the hormonal um, edge and everything else to, right. um, to do this. But yeah, so luckily the, um, the stuff about working with a training while working a, a full-time job, Johnny and I used to work in finance. So I used to work in an investment bank and oh, nice. while I was doing that, I, I competed in the um, national, in the UK national powerlifting federation. Um, now, I was younger at the time, but the, obviously the time demands of an investment banker are are, are pretty heavy. Um, and also now in medicine, like you, you do, you're pounded with night shifts and you're constantly switching between night and day shifts. And I'm sure, I think you've spoken about this um, at length in, in some of your podcasts where it's just the, the, the drain it has on your health and mental state and cognitive state and everything to be sleep deprived all the time is rubbish. And so, yeah, you know, your training does take a hit, but I think it's important for coaches to to be cognizant of that and to say, well, what are some strategies we can do to at least mitigate some of the, um, the kind of fixed downsides of working a job like that. Right. And some of those can be, first of all, to recognize that this is going to sound like a weird, isn't it to start here with a, with a non fitness tip, but to let go of thinking of worrying what other people think of you, Exactly. because when you're in the office and you're doing stuff that can often threaten other people's sense of safety because you're improving yourself in some way, or you're you're looking after your health when other people are kind of seeking comfort or seeking ways to, um, to even damage their health, you will be called a weirdo. And so recognizing that like, I'm just going to do what I do and let go of that is really important. Otherwise it's very easy to slip down the the rabbit hole. Right. The, The rest of it is when there are, it's, you know, the whole cliche of planning to fail is failing to plan. Right. No, what, 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 yeah, what no, was it's if you, if you fail to plan, you plan to fail. You got it. That's it. So, <laughs> so if you just leave like lunchtime as, oh, well, I'll deal with it when I get to it, then of course it's going to default to the point where 
your willpower is at its lowest, particularly on night shifts where we, we know definitively that when you're sleep deprived, your willpower is, is low and also your propensity to eat sugary foods is higher. Right. So it's kind of a, a dual problem. So just prepping food in bulk in advance, and I call it this Monday routine, which is on a Sunday, you prepare your meals for the week right. and you get your laundry in order. You do a, a evening brain dump. You just get everything just sorted so that you're not like stumbling into right. Monday morning, right. just right. trying to like um, placate yourself with junk foods. And it's exactly right, bro. I mean, my wife and I have been doing that, you know, and I'll be 50 soon, less than six months now. And we've been doing that since we met eight years ago. That's exactly what we do on Sunday. We cook up a bunch of grass fed beef. We simmer it, you know, in a big thing. We put it in a glass Tupperware uh, uh, container and then it's simple to make, you know, whether it's an eating day or a fasting day to make a couple of meals, you know, the day of, you know, and a lot of times we used to like, actually, when we were really hardcore, we would prep them. They would already be in there. You just grab them out and run. But nice. now, now with glass, I was, you know, that was back in the plastic days, but now with glass, it's a lot easier, you know, just to do it. And plus I don't eat every day, right? Like today I don't eat, right. I'm every other day eater. So, um, Dude, that's what's, all great what's crazy about that. The fact that you make the, the beef in bulk and you, and you don't eat every day it like even the mental load that it takes off you when you're oh, like, well, insane. I don't, I don't need to decide on what, oh, what am I going to eat tonight and how am I going to, you know, it's just <laughs> sorted for you. It's totally <laughs> it true. Up. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's totally true. And again, that's why I love, you know, when I talk about it and I don't want to hijack, but like, you know, alternate day fasting gives you all the benefits, right. Of ketosis and thermogenesis and, you know, the, the things that happen, the biochemical cascade that a lot of people eat for like low carbohydrate, you know, or whatever, you know, without going into it. But again, the alternate day fasting works for a lot of different people around your training. Let me just ask you one more question and we'll go down the uh, consciousness path. And I'm sure you get this tons with your clients, but, and I'm interested in just your insights. Like, what do you think is the number of days a person should train with weights you know, from say 30 and up all the way until, you know, death, physical body death, um, that will literally provide a strong functional injury free physique for life. It's a good question. Cause I, I see these things through the lens of like, what, what is the normal person realistically going to achieve? Exactly. Um, rather than like, Oh, you gotta, you gotta squat ass to grass every day to a max. And it, you know, you get these people that are like, you're like, man, have you ever lived? Have you ever met a normal person? Like, <laughs> so it, so yeah I, yeah, I I think from someone who is thirty and upwards, if they're novel to if they're new to training, they could respond and actually get a lot of muscle gain just from training twice a week. That's awesome. Um, Great advice. And then you know obviously there is increasing returns up to a point, provided that you can recover from it. Sure. Um, but for people who aren't in our kind of bubble of like really into lifting and enjoy the process. And then the simple advice that I would give to, you know, a patient, for example, would just be train twice a week, do some form of push, some, some form of pull and some form of legs movement and just, you know, super simple and just lift it for five to 10 reps and just aim to do more each week. And I think giving them very broad principles to not kind of get caught in the weeds um, is probably quite a, a good way to, to approach it. If you're, outside of that. Did I, Yusuf, I agree hundred percent. I mean, I, I've been training three days a week now for a decade. Okay. And as you know, right, like even guys with super, um, you know, you know, need, you know, the need to be in the gym, as I call it, like the five to six days a week, guys, you know, mm -hmm. I want to train one body part a day. It's a psychosis more than it is an actual, <laughs> um, you know, physiological gain or advantage because you don't need what, what again, and you know, and this is obviously, you know, suffice it to say, I mean, when you learn to train, right, which we didn't even talk about that, but once you learn how to take your body to positive muscle failure, right, and you can understand like where your body can go, you know, relative to your genetics, you know, relative to your body type, again, as you said, relative to your recovery, your sleep patterns, you don't need that much time in the gym, right? Like, honestly, like for me, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, the days I don't train, I eat. I mean, the days I train, I eat. The days I don't train, I fast. And I do cardio depending on like how lean I want to be. Sometimes I'll do a second session at night, always low, in low impact, moderate intensity, but um, it's crazy. So efficient. Yeah. And, I mean, it's and, exactly and efficiency, but it's, it's crazy to, know, to see guys even in their fifties and older still in there five or six days a week slaying an iron you know it, it's it's crazy and again it's a psychological like i said it's a psychogenic need 
to be in the gym, you know, just as like runners get addicted to running, you know, guys that lift weights get addicted to moving the iron. But as you know, and, and, and you know, it, it doesn't take a genius to figure out as you get older, that will absolutely decimate your body and you That's will it. get like, injured. I, I would much rather do more, out, get more out of less. You know, I, exactly. I, I don't particularly in, enjoy like, ramming my head against the wall for no reason exactly. you know? exactly. so but so many guys um, do you see it right you go into the gym and you see guys in their 50s with three plates on the squat it's insanity it's like what are you competing for now again i'm not talking about professional strongman or power athletes who are training for lifts or meets and stuff like that that's different i'm just talking about the average recreational athlete who you know had glory years let's say in their 20s and 30s and maybe even in their early 50s who are still training like animals and it's like you know my chiropractor, I have like one of the top chiropractors in Southern California. He's a close friend, personal friend of mine. He's a fan of the show and stuff like that. But, you know, he saw me when I was 44, 45, one of those years. And he was like, are you still squatting heavy? And I'm like, well, you know, I put on like two plates sometimes on the Smith machine and go ask the grass, you know, for 25 reps. And he was like, Jay, let me show you this. And he pulled me over, you said, and he, wa he made me watch this video you know, of synovial fluid in the discs and the brain and the joints, right? Like, especially in like L4, L5, L6, all the way down. And he was like, I mean, I watched it and it was like, uh, he's like, okay, so now this is you and you have no, probably very little, if minimal, you know, fluid in there now, why are you still doing that? You know, and he, he kind of showed me like, you know, what would happen if just a slight deviation, right? And I get it, like guys hate, you know, that are like, if you go to squat, bro, you know, will still come at me and say, but, you know, but it's like, I stopped squatting, bro. Now, now to that, to that, I, I, since I've been in my garage, <laughs> I'm doing front squats, right, with no weight, just you know, just literally ask the grass, pull down like to 30 reps, you know, doing two or three sets to to true fatigue, to positive muscle failure with just my upper body, and you know, I weigh about 210 pounds, but it's like, it's crazy, right? Because like you know, people just can't stop doing what their body really can't handle because again, it's a psychogenic like. Addiction. You're absolutely right. Like it's a form of neurosis because neurosis. with with this, like the yes, obviously there's the bravado and like we've we've all been at the point where we've been reading too much T Nation and we're like, oh, like yeah, you got to do what. But but you're right. Like the the muscle, yes, the the weight is a means to an end to provide a stimulus. And I think you've got the right idea that you're like, well, how can I get as much stimulus from as little spinal loading right. as possible? Like it's not like the actual right. spinal loading is the mechanism of growth. It's exactly. it's the you know, it's the training effect. And right. so this was a mistake that I, I definitely made. Like I, I was deep in the teenage. Well, we all do. We all do. Oh man. We all do. And, I mean, I was doing power lifting hardcore up until I was 45, like overhead, you know, presses. I mean, I blew my fucking shoulder out, you know? I mean, it's just, I mean, again, do we all learn? You live and you learn. It's still the, it's the thrill of life, right? You enjoy the ride, right? I mean, but I just, too many older guys, especially, are putting their body under demands and loads that are absolutely at risk to their state of physical being, you know? And again, when I say physical being, I mean like being able to walk and lift up your grandchildren in your sixties and seventies. Oh man. And it, we're so, we've got such a one-sided kind of blindness to this. And I, I was, I was really guilty of it that like, you, there's that, is that quote of like, you ask a healthy man, what would you want? And he gives a list of a thousand things. You ask a sick man, what do you want? He just Health. only, wants his health back and the the price that you would pay when you're ill even if you've like got a sprained ankle just to be able to like walk normally again is is huge so yeah i i learned the hard way like i was i was competing in uh, powerlifting nationally uh my max deadlift was 240 at so to 240 kilos what's that in pounds that's a lot um, it's like four 490 pounds 529 pounds wow that's awesome good job so that, that was a um a body weight of 160 pounds wow. um but that's really strong well it it was strong but it was stupid because you know i was oh, training no, through the pain stupid, but it's still strong. <laughs> <laughs> so i i ended up like always training through the pain and being like no no it's fine it's just doms it's just doms and and eventually got to the yeah that that was it I, I was admitted to hospital with an infection. And while I was in there, like, I think just from being in a very pro-inflammatory state and I already had a pre-existing disc bulge, um, I Fuck. suddenly lost sensory motor function of my S1 dermatome oh my God. and myotome. So I, I lost uh, plantar flexion of my left leg wow. and it took six months for it to come back. I, I thought it was gone. I was like, oh, well, that's it. Fuck. And the whole time I'm just thinking, what an idiot. Like, why did I do that to myself? Right, right, like, right. 
And, and that's the neuroses of, I got to train. I got to be stronger. I got to do it. Yeah. I mean, you really do have to remove yourself from it. And honestly, it takes courage to do it, you know, because again, you, we, we come from this, we're cut from the same cloth. We come from a background of like, do it. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jay Campbell. Quick commercial for the optimized tribe with U S Navy seal, Michael Jaco and I every Monday night at 6 PM Pacific standard time. There is not a single group online where you will get the highest level Intel that Michael and I can provide you from mastering intuition to fully optimizing your hormonal health, to improving your fitness, to raising your vibration and increasing your consciousness. There isn't a single group online with two dudes like Michael and myself, helping people become the best version of their self. It's literally $99 a month and you get a 90 minute call with me and Michael every single Monday night. Don't wait another second. Sign up now at the link, theoptimizedtribe.com. I appreciate you guys and I send you tremendous love and light. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, it, 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 it's, it's true, but it's like, and you know, and we'll go into consciousness next, but like you still can't walk up to those bros and say, hey man, you know, can I give you some advice or, are you open to, you know, you could say, are you open to receiving some advice? But like, you know, it's their deal, dude, their journey, their ride, let them do what they're going to do. You, you know? know what? That's, it's so funny. Like when you see someone in the gym and they're like, you know, proper like hitching a deadlift up and, <laughs> and I, and I'm, I'm like, I, I really feel a moral responsibility to be you like, do. excuse, excuse me, man. Like I'm, I'm just saying this because I don't want you, but I, I can't, can't do, do it because I just no, think it's it. not going to be well received. It'll no. fall on deaf ears. Even if I say like, I'm a doctor and I've, Right. Exactly. My back. doesn't matter what kind of pro or expert you are. Right. No, I mean, it's very true. You know, I learned that lesson a hard way, you know, as an ex-personal trainer. And again, I'm kind of like a body mechanics freak. When I see people doing things in, ineffectively or inaccurately or just poor technique, I want to so bad. But like my wife taught me, she's like, you know, walk up to him and say, excuse me, are you open to receiving some information on how you can improve? That's, that's a good, good and, line. And, 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 you know, if they say soul to soul, Yes, I am. Then you'll know. And then you can say, okay, let me show you, you know, but you can never say, uh, you know, like, <laughs> like bros, like we want to be like, oh God. <laughs> Man, th there's, there's one thing. I, I don't know if um, Ugg boots are particularly popular in the States. What, what are they? Uh, Ugg boots. Like, oh yeah, like no, the, Uggs. Yeah, of course they are. Yeah. Yeah. The sort of California girl, like um, the, the thing that makes me want to be sick whenever I see it is like the knee, valgus knee. Oh, dude. Um, when you see someone wearing old Ugg boots and the heels are sliding out to the side it's and insane, they're just like dude. really flaccid walking it's along insane, and you're like, oh. it's insane. I mean, again, we didn't even talk about that, but like, you know, the average per 90% of people, as you know, go to the gym 40 years out of their life and never do one thing right. I mean, I mean, it's true. I mean, like I wanted to make you stuff. I swear you, you don't, you and I didn't know each other, but I, I eight, eight or nine years ago, maybe it was 10 years ago. I really wanted to make a documentary and it would have been the greatest documentary ever of just like getting a couple of guys, a filmmaker, a writer and me, and just going from North America, I mean, in North America to the Northeast, to the Southeast, to the Midwest, to the Southwest, to the West coast and just film the gyms and just interview people and then make, again, it would have been a mockumentary, right? Because it would yeah, have, been, it would have the, been so entertaining. Man. Bro, the whole premise would have been as gyms are exploding across the world, you know, they're on every corner in LA, they're on like catty corner. People are getting fatter. People are getting sicker. You know, all these things are happening again. And it would just, the videos would just portray the whole thing because you would be watching people, what they do. And then well, you've it, got it this phenomenon. You you've got this thing in the States of planet fitness, which I, we oh, don't have yeah. here. Yeah. And yeah it blew my mind when I saw it. I was like, is this, this is like a comedy thing. It's like a satire, exactly. Exactly. but apparently it's not. Apparently no, it's, it's a real not. thing. No, no. I mean, I mean, well, that was, this was before I had this idea before Planet Fitness, but that's a perfect example. But I mean, yeah, but I mean, even you go into hardcore gyms and you watch people. And again, most people just refuse to ask or hire a coach and they just watch TV or look at the muscle mags, as I used to say, and watch people and just try to simulate and they don't know what they're doing. And they do it for 30 years until their breakdown and imbalances and giant pouches. And just, as you know, I mean, you know, and then you can throw in nutrition and on top of it, it's crazy, dude. I mean, you know, again, it takes a conscious person to ask for help. Right. The thing is like, I've, I've been to the depths of stupidity with nutrition and training, like exactly Both that, us, just dude. indiscriminately reading stuff and being like, Oh, I'm going to try that. I was having a, <laughs> Pint of double cream before bed, cheesecake bro, I mean, in the blender. remember the muscle mags, what they did to us, bro. I mean, <sighs> come on, dude. It's all just laughable. All right, let's get into consciousness. Um, let's do it.
I love talk. I don't even talk to anybody nowadays unless you're into this. So it's so awesome. You just did a 10 day Vipassa silence retreat. You know, everything that I talk about now, regardless of whether it's a podcast, like I have a podcast that I'm going to be talking to uh, after this podcast today, but it's all about consciousness for me. And I love the fact that you literally just went to a 10 day retreat of silence, essentially of stillness. Right. And again, all the sages, the gurus, the ancients, they all talked about retreating into the wilderness, retreating into the cave, Retreating into that place where you are not bothered or encumbered or hindered so that you can literally, is what I call just practice mind silence and live in that now space moment. So talk about your 10-day Vipassana retreat. It must have been phenomenal. Yeah, this is, uh, th- this is funny because the first, the structure of the retreat is obviously no talking no eye contact you get one meal a day or if it's your first retreat you get another one in the evening and you meditate for the first five days doing anapana focusing purely on the sensation at the tip of the nostril and then the following five days you do the vipassana which is the full body internal focus method and i found myself going through i'm not i'm usually quite an emotionally stable quite kind of euthymic guy but I was going through like even day one, intense sadness. And day two was fear. And day three was anger. And day four was like every sexual thought you've ever had. And day, day five, you know, and I remember discussing this with Daniel Ingram, who's, he's an emergency medicine physician and like hardcore Vipassana guy. Like he's, he's completed meditation basically. Nice. Um, he's one of the, he, he is a, he's an Arhant. So he has actually like hit the, beaten the final boss. And he was like, oh yeah, well, that's just the anatomy of the mind. And I was like, what do you mean? He said, well, when the mind is devoid of stimulus for a certain amount of time, those are the exact layers in that order of emotion that, that fall away, like layers of an onion, you have to work through them. And uh, yeah, it, it's so interesting to see that when, when you just stop everything, the dust settles and it kind of settles through these layers of emotions. Um, and, you know, it's very similar to the... Um, the David Hawkins thing we were talking about last sure, time of the sure. apathy, fear, grief, lust, anger, pride. Yeah. And, you know, th- I think there really is something like anatomical about the structure of these and the order that it's in, which is fascinating. And yeah. this is only something that, you know, we, we have to, I think we have to be empirical about this because there's no point waiting for fMRI and um, kind of imaging data or, or biochemical, wh- whatever it is to, to catch up. Right. Because, it's the wrong tool for the job anyway. Like we are operating with consciousness. So we need to use tools made of consciousness to be able to ascertain our, our progress. The other, um, the other insight really coming out of the end of the retreat was that the whole, the whole purpose of the first five days is to develop precision and one pointedness of your concentration. And then the following five days is to apply that to your internal world And what you end up experiencing, like finding out, and I I love the idea of the silent retreat because there's no, it's not like it's, um, there's no dogma, as you said, there's no denomination. It's just, here's the instruction, do it and see what happens. And you come away with a realization that every thought and every emotion has a physical counterpart somewhere in the body and it's being held somewhere in the body. Right which is awesome. And that we can, we can undo our conditioning either through mental reorganization or through actually working directly with the body, which is why I think um, stretching, massage, body work, um, meditation, breath work, all of these tools like Wim Hof method and any of these things that cause us to come into our body and actually unravel it from that perspective, it's probably easier, especially for the likes of us where we're so, we're in such a kind of neck up environment where we're, we're bombarded with information. We're stuck up in our minds. We need something to bring our consciousness down into our bodies again. Yeah. Beautiful left brain. We're, 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 we're trained to just be left brained, you know, emissaries and just rifling through information at all times, especially, you know, the the more your intellect is developed, Um, you know, to to that um, I've actually never been on a actual um, uh, retreat. Um, I've gone into the woods uh, every single day of my life, I spend at least 20 minutes in mind silence, sometimes longer. Uh, but then again, I read. Um, my reading is more contemplation. Like I'll read a section of Walter Russell, 
you know, uh, I think of his books, The Divine Iliad or uh, The Secret of Light, and they're so profound that it's like you have to literally, as, as he says, attain stillness just to contemplate the actual messaging um, that's in these books. But, you know, to, to back to what you were saying, like what you, you know, what, what happens to you is like when you're just completely silence um, or in silence and, and again, you're in the still mind or mind, you know, what, what he calls is the, the uh, stillness of mind silence. It's um, the layers are, you're, you're basically, you're going through your chakras you know, each energy center and you're cleansing them from like, top, you know, top to bottom. Again, like you said, through the stages and your, pro and your thought processes are just kind of slowly but surely unraveling. Like a, 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 like a warp speed version of it is doing plant medicine, right? And again, I'll speak like, you know, like, you know, my experience of MEO, like MEO, when you go into the experience of 5M, 5 DMT MEO, MEO DMT, um, and you're surrendered already to the idea that this is going to be a great teaching moment for you, you know, from a heart standpoint, a heart focused, a heart centered standpoint, and you just surrender to whatever happens, then you are given access to whatever that is. Right. And, you know, some people say it's the source frequency, it's God, it's the energy of the universe. There's a million different names for it. But um, like that to me, the last two times that I've done that now have just like massively accelerated my awareness when I do silence, right? So like this morning, you know, I went out in my backyard, just sitting on like kind of a lawn chair, it just kind of lays back, you know, the sun's on my body, I have my shirt off, I have both of my dogs next to me, actually just have my one, my, my pit bull this morning with me, my feet in the grass grounding, and I'm just completely silent and listening to the birds. Like that's all I know when I go deep into silence is I can just hear nature, which I think is the, the energy of the source field or whatever, again, consciousness, God, whatever you want to call it. Um, and I'm so jealous about the 5-MeO DMT. Like, oh, hey, it's such an amazing experience to be able to do that. But again, and I wrote a really awesome article on it. You can go on Jay Campbell and just search DMT and you can read it. It's very deep. It's like 8,500 8, words. Uh, and I wrote about my wife's experience because it was the first time she did plant medicine too. But the, but the reality is, is like with plant medicine, people have to, in my opinion, go into it surrendered because oh, if you go, yeah. if you go into it, if you go into it with fear or apprehension or anxiety or nervousness or restlessness, you obviously are amplifying what the plant gives you, right? Because the, the plant is 100% an amplification and again, it's, it's, we're going into quantum physics now, even talking about that, right? Because everything is a reflection of your internal, right? I mean, it's the cosmic mirror is always in effect. You go, you know, like you go online and somebody writes a nasty comment or something about you, or, you know, that's their reflection of how they feel about themselves internally. And again, yeah, people who that's work, true. you know, people who work at a level um, to know that kind of, or to, to receive that form of awareness, understand that. Um, and it takes, again, work and, again, mind silence and, you know, retreats and stuff like that to really get to that point. You know, and again, Walter Russell says, which I love, that's what separates believing from knowing. Because we all know everything, but we have to get to a level where we shut our mind off so we stop thinking and stop sensing and allow it, knowing we, we we try and like meddle with it and you're right that taking something as powerful as 5-MeO but still having some kind of resistance to it like it's like you're tightening your sphincter but it's coming in anyway and it's gonna it's gonna cause you some damage you know like <laughs> you, you're inviting god into your into your consciousness you're saying totally. right like i want it and so you've got to you, you're right you just have to co totally open up because if you try and like half hold it out you're just going to get steamrolled yeah. so that's a really interesting perspective and um what you said about Walter Russell. I, I need to read that guy. Actually, you, you recommended him on the last one. Yeah, I'm going to send you, I'll send you my Dropbox file and you can read like, he has actually a home study program, him and his wife. It's pretty amazing. Um, you don't need to do the home study program. If you just read the divine Iliad one and two in the secret of light, I mean, they are heavy, heavy works. I mean, like it, it took me to read the secret of light and I ripped through books. I usually read 80 books a year, but like it took me literally almost three months to read the secret of light and really truly, absorb it and bring well, it if you're stopping to digest it as well I, I guess especially when someone has written something from a point of really very high Most, consciousness yeah, like, literally right here i mean it, it's almost coming from enlightenment literally. yeah that it's it's got to be like taken in sips exactly well as you know <laughs> hawkins literally experienced enlightenment and he talks about it and when it first happened to him he went to a, a, a to the wilderness and he lived in a house 
by himself for three and a half years. And then he was like, okay, I can come back and integrate into the state of physical being around other people. Uh, I mean, I, again, I personally opinion, you know, and there are many, there are so many other out there right now. I could name a bunch of them, but between Hawkins and Russell, that's all you need. I mean, that, those guys define physical existence, the material realm, whatever you want to, you know, experience. And it's like, it's hard. I can say this to you. I, I don't have these conversations a lot on my podcast, but like once you recognize that at base essence, all we really are is spirit, you know? And again, if you want to like physically, you know, identify with something from a physical existence, just think of yourself as like an orb, like an energetic ball, like a light, you know, again, like bio photons, you know, luminescent together or something like that for people that want to experience it. But I say that to you, Seth, I swear the last time I did MEO, which allowed me to read this article, I went into that field so fast. Like I was so happy and excited to go in, you know, it was the first time I ever entered. It was zero fear or apprehension. It was just like, I would love to be, to receive answers. And dude, I'm telling you, I was outside of my body within a minute. I mean, what seemed like a minute, maybe it was three minutes and you're slinky. It's like a yeah. slinky. You're like touching your body. You know, the people that were there, I'm like touching myself and it's like, what is going on? You know, oh, wow, I have a physical body. But that's really what you are. You are at your divine base essence, spirit. And spirit is literally like whirring electrons or vibrating, you know, atoms. I, mean, I totally it. agree that, like, that, that even, you know, if, um, if someone is skeptical of this, of this idea, um, is oh, to just look at it as like, let's, let's ignore the like, the claim of you are spirit at your essence. Like if, if that's too hard to swallow, sure. then it's like, okay, well, what I can see is all of the character armor, all of the, right. <laughs> the social conditioning and all the stuff that I've laid on top of it. I love and that. What, I'm gonna would, use happen? That. what would happen if I was to kind of peel that away? And obviously right. something like 5MEO is a very forceful way to peel that away and, and right. experience it in, a, in its full color. But um, to just realize that when, when that is stripped away for a moment, there is a slinkiness to it. And like the, exactly. when you look at a baby who hasn't developed a character drama, they haven't developed these habitual Perfect. muscle tensions. They are totally open and totally, they, it's not that they're always happy, but they just, any emotion or any impulse that comes up, it's totally uninhibited. And over time, as we grow older and become adults, we take on the kind of weight of, of the world. And we we're told to sit down and shut up and, you know, all of these um, conditioning that stops us being able to express our, ultimate truth bro that's beautiful man literally beautiful you just put me in such an amazing, amazing state for the next podcast let me just ask you a last question and then you can tell people how they can work with you guys at propane fitness and connect with you um mistakes people make about meditation or in their meditation practice and i i already know your i know you're going to go with your answers but um so many people have just been conditioned right that meditation is like sitting in lotus position and silence and you know, so it's like, I don't have time. I can't do, I don't know how you do it, Jay, or you said, but you know, shed some light on really what meditation is and why people have, you know, should have no issue with doing it. Yeah. And so the, the way that I sell meditation depends on the kind of audience that I'm talking to. So sure. if I'm talking to doctors, I know that they're going to be more interested in like the, um, reduction in anxiety pathways on right. fMRI and pain tolerance and um, immune function and those kind of things right. but if I'm you know if I'm talking to someone who's going through a bit of turmoil they'd be like well this is a way to restore emotional stability and right. so I think it's um, it is the benefit that you it has to be seen in, from from the perspective of, of what you're looking to get out of it um, but at the end of the day it is just a case of cushion time. And I think, unfortunately, there is a lot of kind of muck mindfulness programs that have come out online making claims that are the equivalent of like the six minute abs exactly. of the fitness industry. Exactly. Um, and people saying, oh, you'll, you'll achieve massive results in only 10 minutes or six minutes of meditation. You're like, well, if you went into the gym and did six minutes of bicep curls, you wouldn't <laughs> expect a massive result from it. So, right. so I think the first thing is having realistic expectations of like, this is a project that will require a bit of work to get some right. momentum going for sure. Um, but then beyond that, I think finding what is your bottleneck. So right. to, to give it a more physical analogy, like if you have someone who is the kind of typical fat, strong guy who is naturally very strong, but they're quite slow. They're not very agile, not very flexible. You'd look at that person. You'd say, well, what this person needs is a bit of stretching and a bit of cardio and a bit, you know, to counteract 
the strengths that they already have and to build their bottlenecks, build their weaknesses. And if you have the, the opposite, you have someone who's a really slinky yogi, you say, well, they need to do a bit of strength training. So I think the same applies with meditation, that if you have someone who's very focused in their in their mind and is a knowledge worker and you know maybe concentration based meditation is not suitable for them because it's not actually addressing their weak point maybe they need some more body practice but if you have someone who's very emotional and very labile and very uh, frenetic maybe they need something that's grounding and and takes them to a single point and i think your recommendation of uh, david hawkins letting go is great because it's a self correcting mechanism like right. following his method allows you to calibrate and actually whatever your tendency is, it will bring you to balance again. Right. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, it's great that we ended the show with that because a lot of people obviously ask me, they ask you like, where do we start? You know, I, I really want to gain the awareness or start on the path of awareness because I know things aren't the way they, I, what way they seem. And I think that is a really good basic starting point book. There are others, you know, I, I could give others, but I, I think that is an amazing book for people again, who are open to receiving the idea that things as they've been taught, um, you know, outside of the realms of, you know, the matrix, whatever you want to call this physical existence is a great starting point because you're right. Everything is about really just recognition of we're on this journey. You know, you can choose to make the journey as, you know, happy and as joyful and as prosperous as you want, but it all comes down to like, what story are you telling yourself? Right. And so many people are attached to stories you know, that are making them not love and trust themselves. Yeah, it's like when sure. you love and trust yourself, it automatically raises your vibration. And it also, also, also allows you to create attractor patterns that bring like-minded people into your life. So then it just becomes a life of, it's like a cycle of abundance. I mean, it really is. The story thing is huge and getting out of that story because a lot of people will hold on to a story of like, I'm the victim or I am the the whatever, because it serves them or it used to serve them in some way, but it's just stifling their their growth. And, you know, it's, yeah, it's painful to let go of a story that you identify with because no one wants to let go of their own ego. But what lies beyond it is so much more freedom. It's so true that, that we just said, I mean, people literally are attached to their story. Their story defines them. You know, people in their 40s, 50s, 60s, you know, I see a lot of this with like elderly women where they have an affliction or a disease or something. It's a label, right? And then the label becomes who they are. And everybody that comes in their life, they tell them about, well, I have my sciatica or I have this. And it's like just an attachment to it that literally defines them. And you're right. It's just letting go of that. Anyone can choose to let go at any moment. And that's why we talked about David Hawkins, bro. This has been a profound podcast. And fantastic, man. So yeah, man. I, I mean, awesome. I'm, I'm going to push this to the head of my queue. Um, if somebody wants to work with you guys at Propane Fitness or just wants to connect with you online, what's the best way they can do that? So any social media forward slash Propane Fitness. So we're on Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram primarily. Um, also propanefitness.com. Beautiful, man. I really, really, truly appreciate you coming on the show. Guys, remember everyone that watches this show, please support the amazing people that come on. Dr. Yousef Smith is awesome. His company, Propane Fitness, him and Johnny do a great job. Please follow them on Instagram and of course, follow them on Twitter. And remember, raise your vibration to optimize your love creation. We will see you guys very soon.